So welcome to the afternoon session. I think we are dimming the lights because we have a great panel that features some documentary films. Uh, so we'll be showing some clips of films. Uh, throughout these panels, we've been highlighting the work and contributions of distinguished alumni and other members of the community in a range of fields from public policy, education, diplomacy, to journalism, technology, and the arts. And, you know, I think the next panel really illustrates what World Bank President Jim Kim emphasized yesterday during his talk on campus. You know, find something that you're passionate for uh, and apply those talents that you can develop at Brown and elsewhere in ways that advance awareness and promote positive change. And the people we're going to be talking to today uh, really fit that bill. Uh, we have uh, two uh, very wonderful documentary filmmakers, uh, Yoruba Richin and Betsy West, both alumna, and Allison Stewart will be moderating. Uh, let me just say a few words about Allison. She is uh, a journalist, uh, more than two decades uh, of work in this field. Uh, she has anchored news programs on PBS, NBC, uh, NPR, MSBC, She's reported for 60 Minutes. This list goes on quite a long time, Allison. <laughs> CBS <laughs> News Sunday Morning, fine. <laughs> NBC Nightly News, and she's filed from the floor of six presidential connect, uh, conventions and anchored live mm. from the World Trade Center on 9-11. Uh, she began her career as a producer reporter for MTV News Choose or Lose, for which she won a Peabody Award. And most re recently, she was host of the NPR program, The TED Radio Hour. Uh, she has a new book out. It's called First Class, The Legacy of Dunbar, America's First Black Public High School. Uh, and it was named the best book of 2013 by Essence and Mother Jones magazines. And we're just thrilled that she recently joined the Brown Corporation. So welcome, Allison. And you'll introduce Thanks. our panelists. Thanks. You said you were going to keep that yeah. short. <laughs> My ears are red. I'm a little embarrassed. Um, thank you so much for coming today. I'm so excited to talk to these two filmmakers. And I scurried to a dictionary to look up document as a verb, since we're going to talk about documentaries. And it means to record something in written, photographic, or other forms. I chose the written word for my book, First Class, because I really wanted to tell the tale of this extraordinary, segregated public high school in Washington, DC, that produced some of the greatest African Americans of our generation. The first black army general went to Dunbar, the first black graduate of the Naval Academy, the first black presidential cabinet member, first black popularly elected senator, first black woman earned a PhD, goes on and on. I wanted to document that because these people were, no long, were becoming no longer with us because they're their 80s and 90s, and they were the people that could testify to this amazing piece of American history. So people document things for different reasons. We all pull out our iPhones and take pictures. We document all the time. These two filmmakers made these two movies that document important history and important moments in time. So their resumes are long and very impressive, so you can read them later. I want to get right to it. Uh, to my left is Yoruba Richin, who's director and producer of, right, excuse me, The New Black, which is about the intersection of race and gay rights and politics, and Betsy West is the executive producer of makers, women who made America, and it's about this, all the sweeping social changes of the women's movement. And one of the reasons I think you guys are great to have together is, Betsy, your films, it's three hours, three different films, such a huge topic, and Yoruba, yours is about a very, very specific ballot initiative, question six, in Maryland, and the whole film pivots on that initiative. So tell us a little bit why you picked that particular state and that particular initiative at this time. Sure. Um, just a little background to, um, to that question. I started the film, really started conceiving of it in the uh, election night 2008. And that's when Barack Obama was elected president. And I was in California at the time and Proposition 8 was passed. And that's where, um, if you remember, they, uh, California had just granted the rights for same-sex couples to marry and Proposition 8 uh, eliminated that. And it was a huge, painful defeat for the LGBT community. And pretty much immediately, they, the narrative um, became that this was the fault of African Americans because they had come out in such large numbers for uh, Barack Obama, and now that civil rights you know, was achieved for us, we wanted to take other people, away other people's rights, and you know, homophobia was this major problem in the black community. 
I wanted to look at why these two groups were being pitted against each other, what that was about, and untangle that. And that's where I started conceiving, when I started conceiving of the film. I started shooting um, in, excuse me, in 2010, and following some of the characters that we'll see, we'll meet in the trailer, who were working on bridging these two, com two communities, and also working on the issue of LGBT rights within the African American community. Um, and it wasn't, Maryland didn't become uh, really a part of the storyline until the spring of 2012. So I'd already been shooting for two years. But here I was able to document this real time, um, you know, initiative where African Americans were going to be the deciding factor. And um, it just made sense for it to, you know, sort of structure the film. However, these larger issues uh, around homophobia in the black church, around, um, you know, family and acceptance, and how the African American community was grappling with this issue. That, uh, those themes were really important for me to keep throughout the film, because I didn't want it to be just about marriage and just about this ballot initiative. Let's take a look at the trailer for The New Black. Don't let people get you talking about gay rights. This is not about a gay right. There's a difference between civil rights and sacred rights. Same-sex marriage is going to be put to vote here in Maryland. No same-sex marriage in the state of Maryland. Hop your horn, hop your horn if you believe. Many people in the state's religious community, especially in African-American churches, still oppose gay marriage and are vowing to continue their fight against it. Thousands of Marylanders around the state want to see marriage defined and upheld between one man and one woman. All of a sudden, it was black versus gay. Marquise had asked, when are you and mommy getting married? And, well, we're working on it, we're working on it. Regardless of what laws they may write, God designed the family. We were blasphemous enough to compare the gay movement with the movement for civil rights and black folks. Is gay the new black? I believe this election is going to be a referendum on the church. If we don't reach out to these people, who's going to reach out to these people? Opposition. Remember vote for question six. God do not make lesbians. He, he, when, we got the right you. degree to decide. Yes, okay, you, go ahead. but let me finish. You're right. I feel like I couldn't be myself because I thought that I would shame you. Okay, are you ready for the vote? I ain't voting on my own gay. Why? Okay, why? What's up? You don't Let's be clear. This is the unfinished business of black people being free. We are the sheep of Our journey is not complete until our gay brothers and sisters are treated like anyone else under the law. I'm ready to win. I'm ready to make history. One of the things that makes this film really powerful is your cast. You really, the first thing I said to you was I wanted to know where everybody was and what they had done, that young woman, the activist, and the police officer who wanted to marry her partner. Uh, how did you cast the film? So um, the folks in Maryland, um, I came to them because I started following the, merit, the, the ballot initiative. And um, Caress, who's the young activist who you see at the end, she was really the, one of the main people on the streets working, you know, knocking on doors, n working with churches, and she was tasked to like, you know, work with the black community to try to get them to vote for this bill. And she's such a dynamic character that, you know, it's the kind of thing when you meet somebody yeah. and you know right off this is the one. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what was with her. And same with Sharon, too. I met Sharon very early on, um, and she was such, she was so dynamic. She'd come from, Sharon is, um, 
Uh, she's the one arguing with, you know, God, don't make lesbians. And she says, <laughs> she's, and she runs the National Black Justice Coalition, which is the largest African American LGBT, LGBT civil rights organization. And she's a straight woman. She comes from the civil rights community. And she made that change during Proposition 8, too, to start working on this issue because of, you know, similarly how I felt about, about it. So these characters, you know, they sort of come to you. Um, and you just know when, when, when they're right. So Caress talked about she wanted to be a part of history. This is a nice turn for you, Betsy. Your film is all about the history of the women's movement. And it's, uh, it's three hours, three, one hour. They're, they're e all fascinating, but it's such an expansive topic. How did you decide to break it up into three hours? And how, what did you do differently than say, I mean, uh, Yoruba had the good fortune to be able to follow a girl door to door knocking and trying to get people to for the cause. You had to really dive deep into the history of it. Well, it is a big sweeping story, the story of the women's movement. And um, really, we're talking about the, the second wave of the women's movement from 1963 to 1975 when really our society was transformed with new laws and new practices and then ongoing with a backlash to the movement. Um, you know, I was thinking back to my time at Brown because I was here in 1969. I entered in 69 and by the time I graduated in, in 73, everything had changed for women in terms of the opportunities. Title IX, many people think of Title IX as something that had to do solely with athletics, but Title IX also affected professional schools where there had been quotas in law schools and business schools and medical schools, and suddenly that was illegal. And in my case, I wanted to be a journalist. I had um, studied you know, taken full advantage of the new curriculum and studied English, a kind of combined major of English and film. When I got out, um, opportunities were open to me because journalists, in, female journalists in the early 70s had sued both Newsweek and the New York Times. They were groundbreaking lawsuits which put all the media companies on notice that they couldn't discriminate against women. So, you know, in 1975 when I was looking for a job, uh, they were actually looking for women. And I, so I realized I was a beneficiary of these tremendous changes. Um, I say that to, you know, cut to, I have my career, I'm a journalist, I work, you know, for network news. In 2006, uh, my partner approached me, a fellow producer, she had been working, Dylan McGee of Coonhart McGee Productions, had been working for a year on a project about the women's movement. And I was like, well, gee, hasn't somebody done something on this already? It just seemed like the obvious thing. And it turned out that there wasn't really an eyes on the prize of the women's movement the way there had been for the civil rights movement. Uh, so we started to uh, uh, fundraise and to, to think about this idea. The difference with our project was that it was conceived first as a video archive and then as a documentary. So the idea was that many of these stories, because it was a historical um, project, that many of the women were passing from the scene. By the time we started working on it, Betty Friedan had already died. And we felt the need to interview these women before it was too late. And we also thought that the technology was giving us a fabulous opportunity to archive these interviews online and make them accessible to everyone, to schools and to educators. And so that's how we designed the project. We, we did our fundraising to get the money to interview 100 groundbreaking women. We had a panel of experts to kind of you know, narrow down who we would be interviewing. And we did that and launched the um, uh, archive, which is at makers.com, uh, a year before the documentary. And then the documentary we built from those interviews and additional interviews to tell the narrative of the women's movement starting in, in uh, you know, really in 1963, you know, flashing back a little bit to the, to the precedents and the inspiration from the civil rights movement and also, you know, from other organizing. And then going forward kind of to present day. So. You have a great clip. It's a little bit long, but it is yeah. so worth every minute. Yeah, um, it's, it sets up the, the um, really the, I, I, I said that I, under, I, I appreciated that I was a beneficiary of the movement. I don't think I totally appreciated <laughs> the kind of courage and creativity and chutzpah 
of the women who challenged the status quo in the late 60s. So that's what this, this clip will show you. Let's take a look. In 1968, women's liberationists introduced themselves to the American public with a protest against one of America's most cherished institutions. Girls all over the country would watch the Miss America pageant and think, oh, that's the model, that's what I've got to be like. The winner should have talent, looks, personality, looks, poise, and looks. Everybody's got talent. They were supposed to have a talent like baton twirling, but not to be an artist. They were supposed to feel comfortable in high heels and bathing suits, parading around while men whistled. This year's crop seems to be the most beauteous bevy of breathtaking beauties in decades. At the time of the Miss America pageant, Robin Morgan was an anti-war activist. I announced that I was thinking of organizing this thing at Atlantic City, and all of the men couldn't believe it. They said, but that's just a women's thing. How can you, you know, I mean, it's just a Miss America. Oh, my God. On September 7th, Morgan and hundreds of other women gathered on the boardwalk outside the Atlantic City Convention Center. We did have a sense of humor, and we had a certain panache of outrageousness. No more pain! No more trying to hold the plank in vain! We had a freedom trash can in which we threw what we called objects of women's oppression, like brooms and dustpans and curlers, high-heeled shoes and bras and girdles. Oh, those girdles. I threw my 16-year-old son's Playboy magazines in it. And I said something like, women, use your brains. We crowned a live sheep on the boardwalk because Miss America and the contestants were sheep. I disagree with this. First of all, it was unfair to the sheep. At a certain point, a small group went inside. They had a huge banner with the words, Women's Liberation. And when the TV cameras were panning the audience up in the balcony, they unfurled the banner. And all over the country, everybody saw those words, women's liberation. Though few in number, women's liberationists knew how to turn bold public actions into media coverage, expanding the reach of their ideas. 30 seconds on the 6 o'clock news was more important than leafleting on a corner on the Lower East Side for six years. Somebody would come up with a great idea. Then it would just go like wildfire through this small community of radical feminists. The date would be set, and we would just show up. Oh, you're the strong, silent type. Those men, those sex objects. There was the whistle in on Wall Street. And those pants, they just bring out your best. We all went down there and started pinching the guys who came out of the offices. Oh, what a chef. Oh, how about glasses? I like them with glasses. Whispering in their ears and pawing them, and they didn't like it at all. Look at the legs on that one. August the 26th next could be an awful day for American males. That is the 50th anniversary of women's suffrage, and to celebrate it, the women's liberation movement proposes a nationwide strike. Come join us in the march tomorrow. On August 26th, Feminist leaders summoned women all over the country for a show of force. It was to be the first mass demonstration of the movement. Oh, thank you. We didn't have any idea how mass it would be until it happened. I was scared to death that I would get to Fifth Avenue and see only a small group. When I got to 59th Street, I couldn't believe it. Thousands and thousands, and you couldn't see the end of it. In New York and cities across the country, women marched. 
At first, the police gave us two lanes, but by the time everybody had gotten together, it was clear that two lanes wouldn't begin to contain us. So we spilled over and we took over the entire Fifth Avenue. It was so joyous. We were running and skipping and jumping, and there were children and there were men. We took the whole street. There were women hanging out of the office building windows, cleaning women and secretaries and so on. And they would come down. Marching on Fifth Avenue for ourselves had a great feeling of exhilaration and freedom and community in a community isn't exactly enthusiastic enough but contagiousness. Since we're talking a lot about uh, documentary and social change, and that's so much of what your films are about, I'm curious what you think about the movement in advocacy documentary filmmaking. The Michael Moores, who Bowling for Common Line and uh, Fahrenheit 9-11, or perhaps even this movie Blackfish. I don't know if you folks know about it, about uh, orca killer whales at SeaWorld and whether or not this particular whale has, is, his being in captivity has led to him being involved in the deaths of three people and how SeaWorld uh, treats their animals. Some people have said that film is propaganda. The filmmakers obviously, obviously stand by what they've made. What is your take on advocacy journalism? I mean, I think that um, advocacy films have a very important place in, in, in the uh, tradition and um, you know, current documentary filmmaking. I think if we look at uh, Fahrenheit 9-11, no one was really, if you remember that time, no one was really talking about the real, you know, really investigating what was the reasons for the war. I mean, I worked at ABC News at the time, mm -hmm. and we weren't as a network. So uh, there's, you know, ways in which I think that um, it plays a very important role of truth-telling. Now, on the other hand, um, I know plenty of people who find um, and not just to point out Michael Moore, but that kind of filmmaking, very biased, um, you know, and in his case, where there's a personality in there, um, a turnoff that could actually turn people off mm -hmm. from, uh, you know, being exposed to that information. I tell my students that, you know, I think you can do advocacy journalism in, in, in different ways. You can, um, you can actually show the other side, which Blackfish doesn't do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and still have a point of view and still try to say something. I mean, it's the filmmaker's choice. Um, but I just think you have to be very clear about, you know, what you're trying to do and be honest with your audience. Um, Blackfish, I, I, it might have said we tried to interview mm -hmm. the other side, um, but there, you know, you, you just have to be very honest with the audience. And, and the audience doesn't want to feel like they're, they're, something's being pulled over their eyes. How about you, Betsy? You worked in traditional news where there's such a strict standard about making sure that you check with the other side and you present all points of view. You know, um, my husband, Oren Jacoby, who's a documentary filmmaker, reminded me that there is a long tradition, as you indicated, of um, social justice issues in documentaries. John Grierson and, uh, you know, in, in Canada and, the, and in the UK and Paris uh, Larson and then mm -hmm. uh, Really, the first television documentary of note would be Edward R. Murrow's *Harvest of Shame*. I just saw some excerpts from that recently, and you know that was exposing uh, the conditions for migrant workers. And it really—you almost felt like it was advocacy in a way mm -hmm. on a on a, a television network. Um, so I think that all films do have a point of view, but I think there's a um, as a journalist, I really want to get at the truth. And so in our documentary, um, we clearly looked at the weaknesses of the women's movement and some of the failures uh, that they, in some cases, especially in the 70s, alienated people, underestimated their enemies. Um, we, we didn't try to whitewash the story. And, and so for me, that's the line I don't want to cross, uh, which is that, that I want to tell a truthful story. Uh, and, to, and to get all perspectives in it. There were some people uh, some who, who suggested that we not interview Phyllis Schlafly, some feminists. Now, Phyllis Schlafly, for those of you uh, 
too young to know, was the primary opponent of the Equal Rights Amendment in the uh, late 70s, and she basically killed the amendment. Um, in some ways, she ignited the culture wars that we, we still experience today. She was a very important and influential conservative grassroots at, um, activist who probably hasn't gotten her due for mm -hmm. what she accomplished. Yeah. And I felt that um, we had, of course we had to interview Phyllis Schlafly. And not in a way to make her a foil, but to really listen to her and to um, find out what she did and how she did it. I should point that out in your film. One of the most charismatic characters in your film is someone opposing gay marriage. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah. you know, yeah. perhaps because we both come from a journalism background, or we went to Brown, we think that, <laughs> <I> think, <yeah. laughs> that the, you know, I think it paints a broader, more complicated truth. Yeah. I loved when you interviewed Phyllis Shaffley. I mean, when yeah. she popped up on my yeah. iPad, I was like, this is great, uh, and watching I loved the makers. interviewing her. Yeah, I no, mean, that's I was awesome. so, people are like, oh, yeah. how can you talk to her? I was so excited oh, totally, to go talk totally. to her. Oh, totally, totally. And for me, with both my films, with this film and my previous film, which was about land reform in South Africa and looked at how um, Af the uh, indigenous population was trying to gain back land, which had been you know, given to the, to the white landowners, I also interviewed both sides. I had the white landowners and the claimants um, as part of my story. And I just think for you know, the way that I want to tell, f the way that I want to make films, it's just, it, it, it complicates uh, the, the issue and it gives in, in that search for truth that we're trying to, to find by having these different perspectives, you, I think you get at a truth um, that you, know, you don't if you don't have those sides. When we talk about modern documentaries, I want to get your take on whether or not there should be an entertainment value. A lot of people sort of in the documentary community harumphed when 20 Feet from Stardom won the Academy Award for Best Documentary. It's about background singers. It's a really fun documentary, really beautifully produced. But other documentaries in the category included The Covert War in Afghanistan, um, a, a the long, Square. The Square. Yeah, the Square about Tahir Square, a uh, piece killing. about. Um, a piece Indeed. of the killing about the in Asia, and some people said, "Well, why did the movie about backup singers yeah. win?" Uh, what should documentaries have an entertaining edge to them? Do they have to in 2014? <laughs> it shouldn't be uh, take your medicine, really. Mm -hmm. They should be um, engaging. They should have good storytelling, Absolutely. great characters. Yours, I mean, your your characters just look so fabulous. You want to see those people. Right. And I think that all of us are trying, you don't want to preach to the choir, mm -hmm. you don't want a bunch of people to watch your documentary who already believe you know, everything that it's about. You want to get out there and tell a story that's engaging to people. So definitely we're using um, narrative and creative techniques to weave the most compelling story possible. And I think what's exciting about the field now is that that's happening more and more. Um, regardless of whether you thought 20 feet from stardom should have won or not, I'll, I won't broach that. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, look at something like Act of Killing, which was controversial. And the, he, mm -hmm. the filmmaker, is setting up these characters to reenact their roles in the Indonesian genocide. Another film that um, I thought was one of the best documentaries that wasn't nominated is Stories We Tell, yeah. mm -hmm. Sarah Pauly, which Sarah yeah. Polly, which she used narrative, narrative, um, you know, elements that you didn't even know till the end was that she was, you know, that were, that were acting. They were recre they recreations, were recreations yes. with an actress and you find out at the end, I mean, she's honest with you yeah. at the end. Right, and I thought yeah. it was one of the most brilliant ways yeah. to tell this story around, you know, lies and, and family secrets and all that kind of stuff. So entertainment, ultimately people want to see a good story. They don't want to take their yeah. medicine, as you just said. As you were making your documentaries, did you find something that completely surprised you, that you stumbled on and said, I, had, I didn't really know this before. <laughs> For me, I know that what that was. That was very early on, actually. And it was during my sort of research phase where I, and I'm like a political junkie, so I was really surprised that I didn't understand how um, the Christian right had very early on strategically worked with powerful members of the black church um, 
to you know, promote an anti-gay political agenda, agenda. And this had started happening in the 90s. Um, and it's in the 90s when we first see these political battles around gay marriage, you know, um, I mean, not gay marriage, around gay rights. So it's like the Human Rights Ordinance, yeah. which I profile in, uh, in Cincinnati, um, in Michigan. And you see these coming together of the Christian right and the and local black church, and then we had that also in uh, the 2000s with the Bush administration and the faith initiative strategy. Um, so that was something that I wasn't that I was like, oh, that's something that that is interesting to me, and that shows the political machinations that are happening around this, and also strange bedfellows. And I thought that would be, you know very interesting to understand how that has played into how the African American community mm -hmm. is grappling with the issue. Actually, I had a, a similar um, discovery, which was how the opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment was the first time that the um, religious right had come together, uh, had different denominations from the religious right had come together. In other words, you had uh, Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish conservatives who united on this issue mm -hmm. against the Equal Rights Amendment, and they had never really worked together. Uh, which I thought was yeah. uh, very interesting. I mean, I had many revelations because, you know, as you said, it's a sweet, it's a sweeping story. I mean, I had no idea that women couldn't run in the Boston Marathon in 1967. Oh, a great story. I Tell mean, the Boston Marathon story. Yeah, I mean, this is a great story. Who knew that they couldn't? We'd forgotten this, but you know, Catherine Switzer, a young uh, Syracuse University junior, was a great runner, but there was no team at Syracuse. She trained with, like, one of the part-time managers of the team, and, and one day he was talking about the marathon. She said, well, I'm going to run the marathon. He said, you can't. You're a woman. And she said, well, yeah, I can do it. And she entered with her initials, and she, they got there, and she, nobody really noticed that there was a woman there except for some of her fellow runners. You know, they're all going, it's a girl, it's a girl. And then <laughs> the race manager was on the press box, and um, the, the reporters were kind of um, goading him on and saying, hey, look, there's a woman running. It's against the rules. And so he jumped off the bus and physically attacked her wow. in front of the cameras. So the whole thing is documented. It, I mean, it's kind of an amazing story. Mm -hmm. And 1967, I had no idea. It took then five more years before the Boston Marathon was officially open to women. Incredible. I, and there's so many of those stories that I think young women don't know about what it was like for women and the kinds of restrictions that were just accepted that nobody even talked about. Um, we're going to talk for a few more minutes, but there are microphones in the aisle, and then we're going to open it up to Q&A. So please join the conversation. Think about a question and head over to the mics shortly. Uh, the dirty word, funding. Funding. Um, <laughs> yeah, I thought the F word was feminine. It's funding. It's actually <laughs> funding. Tell me about trying to fund your project. Sure. And did you run into any obstacles given the subject matter? Well, I was really lucky uh, in that very early on I had PBS support. So there is a, um, uh, a funding um, entity called ITVS, mm -hmm. which is one of the largest funders for independent documentary filmmakers. And um, I was lucky enough to get a development grant from them, and then they came on pretty early on as co-producers. So that alleviated um, a lot of stuff, but still it was hard. I mean, we, the way that I've gotten funding is you know, through grants and th through some private um, investment support, um, you know, but it's, the time that it takes, and you get a lot of rejections. I mean, we were lucky enough to get Sundance and Tribeca, and Ford Foundation came in at the end. Uh, but you know, there's those gaps when you don't know what you know how you're going to pay people, or much less yourself. Um, and you know, it's a constant, constant hurdle. Um, but you know, as I said, I the I think because the issue was so timely for folks, a lot of I had a lot of great support. A lot of people came on board for the film. How about for you, Betsy? Yeah, it was about a five-year odyssey, again, with um, going to foundations. I think what helped us uh, was this idea of doing the video archive first and yeah. using uh, the internet as a platform for telling these stories. And that appealed to the Revson Foundation initially, mm -hmm. and they gave us a grant that really helped get us going. But we went to many meetings and 
fundraising events and other things to, to get the money to the point to raise the money to do the archive. And then at that point, uh, we also had PBS support, but not much financial support from them. But they, they were going to broadcast the documentary. At that point, um, AOL came in as a uh, full producing partner. So that was a lucky thing. And AOL's idea with this was to take the video archive and to continue it. So beyond the 100 groundbreaking women on makers.com and the interviews that we initially did, subsequent to the documentary, they have continued to do interviews with younger women, uh, you know, entrepreneurs and Lena Dunham and all kinds mm -hmm. of women to connect to a younger generation, which I think is fantastic. I mean, they, I think the video views on the website alone are up to almost 100 million now. They wow. have had a huge, they do a huge outreach for makers and a kind of makers movement that they call it, and, cool. and so that's how we that's how we funded it. In making documentaries now, as you present to folks for fundraising, do you have to present a bigger picture, a social media plan? Do they want to just not hear that you want to make this fantastic <laughs> film yes. from your heart? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the difference between making my first film and this film. My first film, I started in 2004. This film, from the beginning, I had to think about what my outreach plan was. Not only think, but have it like start. You know start work on that, my, my outreach, how I was going to work with, you know, community organizations, educational institutions, who my audience was, because there's so much stuff out there. There's so much visual material, material out there. I think that funders want to know how this is going to be seen and how it's going to be, especially if you're doing a social issue documentary, mm -hmm. how it's going to be used. Um, and, you know, a lot of us, it can be very overwhelming because you are, you're trying to make your film and already, already you have to be an outreach person. So there's a lot of actually kind of interesting work, a lot of surveys being um, you know, sent around by different organizations to see how this is gonna play out because I think it's not, I don't think it's particularly sustainable for filmmakers mm -hmm. to have to also be outreach people. Some filmmakers don't wanna be. You know, some filmmakers are just like, I want to make my film. Other filmmakers do. I'm kind of like in the middle. I'm like, I want to be a part of the outreach, but I still want to be able to be working on my other films. Yes. You want to move on to another project, perhaps, rather than to spend the next three years of your life doing the outreach. Yeah. But it is something that the foundations are demanding. And I think also because of the, the changes in the technology, I mean, not only are things uh, dispersed and the impact of your film, it's very hard. It's not just like, oh, what rating did you get or what was your box office number? There's so many platforms in which you can see something um, that, and you can also measure what that is. You know, you can get data to measure it. I think the foundations want to do that, but it sometimes can get in the way a little bit of, hey, I just want to do my story. Um, yeah. On the other hand, you like your story to get out there, and so I'm, I, I'm not saying I don't want the outreach to happen, because I think it is a great thing, and you want to get it beyond the uh, usual suspect audiences. You'd like new people to be seeing it. I mean, there's nothing that makes me happier than to have a young woman come up to me and say, you know, oh, I saw Makers, and I just love it, and I had no idea, and, you know, and Gloria Steinem, I always thought that she was a man-hater, but, like, you know, I mean, or whatever they say, it just it, that makes me feel great. So. Yeah. This is my last question before I take questions from the audience. You both teach, which I think is, is yeah. interesting. What do you see in your classes? What are your students interested in making films about? Well, I, um, I'm at CUNY in New York at the graduate uh, program. And my students are, it's a journalism program. And basically, my class is the first time they're thinking like filmmakers. So my job is to get them to take their reporting skills that they've been learning for the last year and now transfer them to uh, start thinking like a filmmaker and what that means. Um, the kind of topics that they're interested in, because it's journalism school, you know, tend to be very journalistic, but there are, you know, I've had, we have an international program, we've had um, students who, um, you know, I've had a stu students who are doing stuff internationally around women in, in the Congo, for example, mm -hmm. very locally around uh, public education and privacy. Um, you know, I, I, a, a real range, but um, I'm really making that connection between journalism and, and film. That's, that's kind of the role we see at, at CUNY. How about for you? What are your students interested in? I'm also teaching at a journalism school, at Columbia Journalism School, and 
Uh, it's a range. You know, some of these students, some of my students, want to learn how to do video stories because they can't go out and get reporting jobs without having those skills. I mean, even a newspaper job, they want to know, can you shoot video and can you edit? Um, so these are skills that they feel they need in, to do their reporting. Uh, some of them want to be documentarians and the kinds of issues, I think social justice issues are huge. Gender issues, con that, that seems to be something that they're very interested in all the time. Gentrification, <laughs> one of their favorite uh, topics. But um, I've had some you know, just fantastic uh, films come out of the school that have gotten into festivals, and they're often, I think, on social justice issues. That's good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's take some questions. We've got some over here. Hello. My name is Irene Sinrich Sudak. I'm class of 81, and I have a parent, I have a son who's in the class of 2017. And I want to first of all thank you very much for the conversation. You have uh, inspired me to add a few more things to my bucket list in my very busy life to, uh, to learn more about it and to see. My question for you, Betsy, in particular is, from what you learned through your journey, why do you think it is still so hard for women to break into the C-suite and on boards of directors. Um, I'm a fellow parent of a class of 1917. I mean, 2019, <laughs> 2000. <laughs> Shows where my That's head amazing. Is. We made a good documentary about that. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, um, it's, when we interviewed Nancy Pelosi, she said something so telling, I thought, with this kind of fiery look in her face. And she said, you know, power is not something that people give up willingly ever. <laughs> <laughs> and I amazing. think, yeah, it was just one of those great quotes. Yeah. And I think there is something to that. And I also think that, um, that Cheryl Sandberg has put her finger on something in terms of women holding themselves back. And Anna Fells has done great work on women and ambition. Um, I, I, it's taken some time to, uh, to, to shatter the glass ceiling. In some ways, you know, we interviewed a lot of the women who went into politics in the early 70s in the wake of the women's movement, like Pat Schroeder. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when she went into Congress, I think there, you know, there were like 4% of the women in Congress. I mean, there were just a, maybe 20 women. And she's kind of stunned now in 2014 that it's just 20 percent i mean i think that many people would have predicted that it would be 50 percent of the women in in congress I mean, of the people in congress would be women uh it takes a long time did you find it surprising that someone like melissa meyer who is the head of yahoo didn't identify herself as a feminist and do you think that may be part of the problem to address your question that some of the younger women won't identify with the movement you know, I think that the word feminism was demonized in the 80s, and I think that kind of uh, continues. Maybe that's changing a little bit. So it didn't surprise me that she said that she didn't consider herself a feminist. I think that it's sort of a definition issue. I think mm -hmm. mo most people, most women, most working women agree uh, in the definition of fairness for women for participating, you know, as equal partners with men in. Um, our political and economic and social life. I, I don't think she would have disagreed with that, but the word was somehow tainted. So I, I wasn't that surprised. Great, thank you. Thank you. Another question? Oh, I'm sorry. Let me do this side first. I'm sorry oh, I didn't okay. see you. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Leah Bromberg from Brown Class of 2011. Thank you both so much. Um, I was very interested in a little bit of what you were saying about technology, and you were referring to it mostly in the context of funding. Um, but I was interested in the way that film, which is now seen sort of ironically almost as more of a traditional medium with the developments in like social media, the internet and the web, I was curious if there were some other ways um, or specific other ways in, in which you were using the internet, the web, or social media in, in new ways as you, you know, engage with your audience or try to bring up funding or, you know. Definitely. Um, I think, you know, we, as, as we do our outreach, that's one of our major um, ways that we're doing our outreach is through social media. 
Um, we're planning an I Am the New Black social media campaign, which we're currently fundraising for, to really bring um, you know, African American LGBT people out of the shadows and, and visible and to tell their stories. And we're looking at doing that through social media. Um, you know, I'm on, I'm on Twitter, I'm on, well, I don't really use Instagram, but I should be, Tumblr, all of those things are really essential to um, not only promoting the film, but to bringing the community of people who are interested in your film together and to connect. Um, you know, there's, I mean, I think it's amazing what you, how you guys started as a video archive first on the internet, and that continues after the film. Um, I love that, and I, I think that's happening you know, more and more. And you're right, film is a, a, a traditional, you know, traditional uh, a medium at this point. Yeah, I mean, I recently did uh, my first Kickstarter campaign last year. That was very exciting, which, you know, is a, is a crowd sourcing uh, tool where you put your project out there and, and people, people give money. It was a lot of work, but it's using a, it's using a new technology. At the journalism school, um, other professors, not me, but other professors who are really experienced in statistics are doing a lot of work on um, deep diving data and, you know, big data, which can inform uh, reporting that you can actually, you know, take data archives and report them, find stories inside them. Mm. Uh, so I think, and also data visualization, I think these are all areas uh, that, that people are exploring. Yeah, and uh, also too at, at our journalism school, same, same deal. Um, there's going to be a new class where they're looking at um, Google, Google Glass, yeah. how to use that for reporting. Mm -hmm. So I think journalism, because of the technology and because of the pressures and challenges that, journalism, mm -hmm. that it's putting on journalism, right. are really kind of at the forefront of you know, digital storytelling. Thank you to the uh, woman on the Gentlemen, they switch places. So, uh, Jose Estabil, class of 84, my apologies. I'm uh, the panelist I, um, uh, on the next session, and I need to uh, cut out of here in a second, but I was looking up on the internet. Um, two of my classmates are also documentary filmmakers, Jenny McKenzie and Deborah Scranton. Uh, Earth Made of Glass, War Tapes, and Kick Like a Girl are three um, movies be between them. And I wonder if you could talk about what at least I heard on a panel at a reunion about the asymmetry and access to being able to produce and direct um, documentaries versus producing and directing feature films as a woman. Go. And, and, and <laughs> well, I don't know what it's like to produce and direct feature, feature films. Film, yeah. I can't tell you yeah. uh, because I haven't been in that world. You know, I think if you, uh, I think for producing and directing documentaries, there are a lot of women out there who are doing it. Maybe that's because it's not such a lucrative profession. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It takes a lot of determination. You got to really want to do it. Uh, and um, and I'll just add to that. Um, I was part of the Sundance Women's Initiative last year, where they were looking at the different, you know, at some of the statistics around female directors in feature and documentary. And certainly, there were there was much more opportunity for women in documentary. And you know, there is a question mm -hmm. of, of why is that? Um, I, I have they friends, pay less. <laughs> a bit, right? And I have friends who do both. And. Um, you know, who are, who are still struggling, struggling to make their first feature. I think there's something about documentary. I started, oh, I keep doing that. I started um, doing documentary with just a camera and going out to South Africa and on a fellowship. It's harder to do that with feature film. So th I think the entry level, yeah. the, the barrier yeah. to, to entry is higher for feature film. And of course, you know, there's, there's the studio system, and, you know, which is also collapsing in a lot of ways, but it's still male-dominated in a patriarchal system um, and a white patriarchal system. So um, it, it's very difficult. Though we did have you know, good representation, at least racially, at this year in film. We'll see what happens after this year. <laughs> Right here. Hi, uh, my name is Camera Ford and I'm a sophomore here. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank all three of you. This has been a really like enlightening and awesome discussion for me to hear. Um, so I'm taking a class in creative nonfiction writing this semester and that's had me thinking a lot about um, 
like process, the process of creating something. So I was wondering if you all could touch a little bit more on the process of creating a documentary. I know you touched a little bit on the elements of storytelling and how that's important. And I was wondering if, like how much, I guess, how much of what you want to put out there is planned and, or do things come up organically or like, yeah. you know, how, just how does the process work, basically? <laughs> well, for, for me, um, it's a great question. You know, the creative process is something of a mystery, right, in, in a lot of ways. For me, I really, when I feel, get an idea and I can get it through, you know, that experience on election night, through reading an article, through talking to somebody, and I sort of feel it in my bones, um, and I, you know, start researching it, trying to understand it, trying to see if there's a story there. Um, I think I'm inspired by so much, by books, by film, by narrative, by, you know, television. Um, I think as a documentary filmmaker, you have to, that's what's so great about the field, you have to be really open to things um, and open to ideas and open to what people think about stuff. You know, one of the things that I do when I have a new idea, I say, hey, I'm thinking about this idea, you know, to get their reaction if they think it's good or if they're like, oh, that's boring, you know. So there's, the, I think the process is really, um, it's almost sort of like a physical thing and um, it comes from so many different places. Um, one thing I will say in terms of my own process that I found very helpful is that, you know, um, documentary is all about, you know, the edit and showing, to me it's very important to show different cuts to different audiences because you're working on these films for two, three, four, five, ten years, and you are so in it that some, you know, at some point you can't even really judge it, and you need other people's input, I mean, people that you trust. And I think that, that a lot of times we you know, can be afraid of, we don't want people to criticize us or steal our ideas, but I found that that's been one of the most, be, you know, one of the most beneficial things to my creative process. Yeah, people have different ways of working. I learned this recently because my husband and I worked together on uh, a short film for Brown that was shown last night. And uh, I found that we have very different uh, ways of working. <laughs> I would say that he's much more expansive. And I am, because maybe because of my journalism training, I'm always you know, cutting things down oh, and, and yeah. narrowing things down. So I actually, ultimately, I came to appreciate his way of working, which is you are gathering a lot of material. Mm. At a certain point, you have to make decisions. You got to start cutting it. You've got to start organizing it. You have to start figuring out what's the beginning, what's the middle, and what's the end. And is this thing interesting to, and I mean, it's no longer interesting to you. At yeah. a certain point, you're so bored by the thing. You have no perspective on it. Right. And you have to try to kind of muscle through that and, uh, you know, as you say, show it to other people and, um, you know, it's And just that's the happens. hardest part, yeah. figure out what's the beginning, what's the middle, and what's yeah. the end. It is. <laughs> it is. like the structure is the hardest, and yeah. you, yeah. That's you move things around, you yeah. try this, you try that, suddenly you get a feeling, you get an right. insight, you go, oh my God, that thing right. in the middle is so amazing, I could move that up here, I could do this. You just work with the material long enough and it comes to you. And a good editor. A fabulous editor, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you can do anything Thank about. you. We have a Thank question you everybody. so much. Yes. Thank you, I'm Cindy Elder, and I received my MPA here at Brown through the Taubman Center last year, and I work for the Rhode Island Community Food Bank. I have uh, really enjoyed this and looking forward to seeing both your documentaries in full, not just the taste. Um, the question I have is that when we think of great movements, we generally think of great leaders. And as we think about teaching a new generation of young people to become involved in our world in various different ways, not all of them can be leaders. Many of them will play small roles, but important roles. And I'm wondering to what extent, as you do these documentaries on movements, that you look at the foot soldiers of the movement. I think bo both. Do. I think both films yeah, do. Yeah, they both films do that. I, mean, I think that, um, you know, in my film, for example, I'm following these on the ground activists who are the foot soldiers in the movement for LGBT equality. Um, I'm, I'm so happy that the film turned out and in no way did I expect that it would start off this way to be a film about activism um, and to be a film about a movement. And you know, I think what's so amazing about uh, the makers too is that it, 
that it interviews the foot soldiers. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of unknown, unsung uh, heroes in, in makers. I mean, clearly we do Betty Friedan's story, we do Gloria Steinem's story, but there are many other women who played critical roles who haven't gotten the kind of recognition, and that to me was the, the most fun. You know, to discover Lorena Weeks, you know, who, who was a telephone operator, and in, in 1967, and she wanted to apply for a job as a linesman, you know, and she would make twice as much money. And the company said, no, you can't do that because you can't, it, it's only for people who can lift more than 20 pounds. She's like, you know, hey, anybody who's had a baby can lift more than 20 pounds. And she, with the help of the National Organization uh, for Women, took them to court and she won the right to do that. And I mean, she's an amazing woman, just such a great interview. And when you discover those people, that's, that's very thrilling. Yeah. We have time for one last question. Oh, gotcha. Um, applaud the documentary on Brown last night. I, uh, that oh, was the one that you. I did see. Um, and it was amazing. Uh, Renee Morris, class of 80. Um, my question is, I, I'm on a board that um, is going to tell the story of the home for age of colored women that dates back to 1860. My mother's 92, mm -hmm. and we have the very issue of this generation of people that are the, are the ones to tell the story that they are getting old. How, does, how do we begin the process of onboarding the, the director and the producer, and how do we understand these transition points and the roles well enough, because I was an engineering major, no clue, but I have to get this done in the next year or two. I don't have 10 years to do this. And so therefore, um, in, in that dynamic of timing, how do we avoid getting overwhelmed by all of the input and making those transition points and getting the right people in the right roles? Because I don't know how to best approach the conversation to the professionals like yourselves of what do you need to hear about onboarding you in order to get that underway in an efficient way. How do you I, start? That's a complex How do you start? question. How do you I have a more like that. Yeah. There's the role of students, there's the role of, of the director, producer, and well, I'm totally overwhelmed. I th if I think I understand what you're saying is, um, you know, I, I just had this where someone called me and said, we're interested in doing this sort of big topic. What do I need, what do I need to tell you as a director? So I, I kind of, so I need to hear, um, what your story is, right? What the story is. Just even in the broadest, biggest terms. Um, what's different about it? What's different right. about it? Has it been... Meaningful about it. Right. Yeah. Um, has it been... Is it something that, you know, I'm thinking as I'm doing, is this something that's been done before? Are there other things like this around? Um, characters. Who are the characters that can tell it? Are they dead? Are they alive? Um, you know, are they older? Is it something that, you know, you have to start doing right. immediately? Um, what other ways can you tell if you're, do you have access? Do you have access to those characters? Um, funding, what kind of money do you have in place to get started? Um, yeah, I mean, I think those are, those are all the right questions. If you have somebody who is quite elderly and you want to hire a very good cameraman and a really good, you know, mm -hmm. producer to, to get an interview done because you, feel that should get in place, then maybe that's a smart thing to do, if that's Sorry. the critical person. I mean, right. we had that, that case with a film I'm working on uh, now, that the, the hero of the film was you know, 92 years old, and, and I kept talking to my director and saying, we've got to get him on tape, we've got to do it, we've got to do it, and we did, and, and he did in fact die about six months later, mm -hmm. so that's something to think about too. The other thing too is ne don't underestimate these amazing students that you have all around, because students today, yeah. Yeah. they are editing, they are shooting, they have access to cameras, I mean you can get a, a great you know, DSLR camera for not that much money and it can look really good. So even if you don't have funding in place or even if you don't know what that's, what, you know, ultimately what your story is going to be, you can get someone to go and shoot, pay them a little bit of money to go and shoot, you know, that interview and just to get started. I mean, also too, if you have something to show, you know, and say this is the, you know, this is, this is, 
part of what I want to do, you can get more people on board. Yeah, video talks. Had, people yeah. really respond if you've got some great interview with just like a one minute clip that's yeah. dynamite. That can, that can go a long way. I think we have to wrap up, yeah. unfortunately, but I do want to say quickly, where can people see your film? Yes, so actually, The New Black is playing at the cable car next, uh, April 9th and 10th. So great. Um, so I'll be there for the, the April 10th showing. I would love to see you tell, you know, tell, tell folks cable car is a great place to see films. And also, we air on PBS at Independent Lens June 16th. And your film is available on the website currently. Makers.com, you can stream, you can download and stream for free all three hours of Makers, Women Who Make America. And there's going to be a new series coming up starting in June on PBS. Thank you, both yeah. of you, so much. Thank you. Thank you.